I'm very, very happy and honored to introduce to you uh, Professor Gardi, University of Pittsburgh. Um, he, he is uh, about on the self proper motion of rigid body in uh, viscous uh, rigid by time periodic uh, boundary data. Yes, thank you so much, Yoshiro. Thank you. Uh, as I said, the only regret is that uh, I cannot be really in person to be, you know, in Tokyo. And uh, yeah, we are also missing you, so I'm very sorry to you. <laughs> Heavily missing you, missing you all. So I uh, now, it's, uh, I think the screen is already here. So can you see this? Can you see my slide? And uh, okay, so it's very, uh, as I said, it's also kind of emotional to give this talk uh, many, many, for many, many reasons, many, it's emotional for me. And one of the reasons is that, as I said, after 10 years, this is the first time that I, I, I cannot join you in Tokyo. Uh, and uh, also because uh, I remember when uh, Professor Shibata organized the, the second school actually, in uh, mathematical fluid mechanics uh, when he moved uh, uh, to uh, Waseda in 1998. That was December 1998. The first school was in uh, uh, 1996 and, uh, um, and was in Scuba at that time. And so he organized another school in 1998. And I remember that uh, the participants were, uh, among the others, they were John Haywood, Rolf Ranacher, Robert Finn, uh, as a special uh, side lecturer. And, uh, and, uh, I, uh, and one of the, one of the uh, main topics that I covered, so exactly 22 years ago, was exactly this self-propulsion. Because this was the first time that I was studying this kind of problem from a rigorous mathematical viewpoint. And so, it's a kind of interesting that uh, 22 years later, I am talking about the same subject from a different perspective. I'm not given the same talk <laughs> that I gave in, in 1998, of course. And in fact, uh, uh, I guess that this is a, a nice application of, uh, uh, a nice use more than application of uh, nonlinear functional analysis. Okay, so the, Topic is the self propulsion of a rigid body in a viscous liquid by time periodic boundary data, as announced by Professor Shibata. So, first of all, I would like to give you, uh, I don't know if you can read this, but in any case, it's just the, the, the frame title is Motivation and Preliminary Considerations. So the, the basic question is the following How can an animal or a mechanical device in general? propel itself in a viscous liquid. So how come that just by moving parts of the body, this uh, animal or mechanical device moves into a liquid? Of course, the typical example is the fish-like object, uh, which not necessarily have to be alive, could be also mechanical devices, and uh, uh, swimmers, and where the propulsion is due to a time periodic change in shape of, of the body. So this is a very uh, simple cartoon. So basically this fish-like is moving by uh, oscillating part of, uh, of its body. It's also interesting to notice that the first ever who studied this problem in details uh, was uh, Alfonso Borelli. And uh, he was a Neapolitan from Naples, like I am, Naples, Italy, Napoli. And he wrote uh, a very substantial volume called uh, about the motion of the animals. And uh, um, he also was a mathematician, of course, a mathematician in, in the, in the uh, 1700. So with the kind of restricted knowledge of uh, what we call mathematics now, but still with the formulas, he was trying to explain how uh, uh, fish in particular uh, or uh, can move. However, you know, this is 1680. The uh, study, a rigorous mathematical analysis of self propulsion is, in fact, a, a very, uh, very young uh, area of research because it started two decades ago. And, uh, you know, uh, if you allow me, I take the paternity of, of, this, uh, of, of, this, uh, uh, of this kind of study uh, going back to uh, Waseda in 1998. So, uh, I, the, I, the first paper I published on the topic was in 1999, 
uh, and uh, uh, and then there were, of course, a plethora of other uh, papers written by different authors, uh, different years, uh, and you see that the, the latest I I um, quoted is the a paper by Professor Ishida and uh, and his collaborators uh, three years ago. But there are many others which are represented by this dot 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 that I put at the, at the very uh, end of the slide. I'm talking about the rigorous mathematical analysis because that's where uh, what I'm really interested in, in discussing. Okay, so now uh, let's take all these papers here and uh, uh, analyze these papers in the time-dependent case. So what is the main contribution of these papers in the time-dependent case, which is the, the case that I'm interested in? So uh, these papers, basically, they are uh, concerned with the problem of well-posedness, so existence and uniqueness of solutions. So they write down the model, which is a combination of uh, fluid structure interaction with Navier-Stokes Navier interacting with some structure, and uh, they tackle the problem, which is absolutely non-trivial, of studying existence and uniqueness of uh, uh, the corresponding initial boundary value problem. This in different situations, the region of flow can be bounded or unbounded, there could be one or more bodies, and from the mathematical point of view, they treat both weak and or strong solutions. So, but the main focus is well posedness So the unresolved aspect of uh, all these papers that I quoted and other available results, is that uh, after all they do not ensure that uh, the body really moves so it's proved the existence and uniqueness of solutions but uh, the, the these theorems which as i said are highly non-trivial they don't ensure that the body moves so that the fish can really move so uh, i say this in a in a sentence with the known mathematical analysis we are not able to infer that the fish in quotes, of course, indeed moves. So we know that uh, there is some motion, but we don't know if this motion is really allows the fish to cover a finite distance in a finite time. And this is, of course, an annoying open question. So another example of uh, self-propulsion is the uh, vibration-induced motion of a rigid body. So of course, if we think of a fish, the fish has to move parts of its body in order to move. Uh, there are, however, other examples. I picked one. This is what is called the vibration-induced motion uh, of a, a rigid body. So the body is rigid. Basically, the shape doesn't change with time, and the motion is induced by vibration. So here is the, in particular, this has been studied recently, starting, you know, something like uh, 10, 12 years ago, in Russia by the uh, Russian School of uh, of uh, Mechanics in in uh, actually the, the Academy of Science. I will tell exactly uh, the title in, uh, of this uh, of this group in, in a moment. So this is uh, this is an example of vibration induced. So uh, now uh, this is basically a cylinder. Let's say the the size of this cylinder is maybe five centimeters. It's not so big. So here is a cylinder, and there are two rubber rings. One at the one at the, the top, and the other at the bottom. The cylinder oscillate up, oscillates up and down, up and down, up and down, and uh, these are uh, these rubber rings. Uh, they uh, touch the, the this plastic tube, and because of the friction that is between the rubber and the, the tube, this cylinder, just because of this induced of this vibration, is able to move. So it moves just because of vibration. Uh, I. I, I have a, a, a movie that I would like to that I would like to show you if I can now. Uh, now I have to remove this, uh, or I can do this actually. Yes, here, and I would like to show you this movie. Yes, one more time. Okay, and so forth. So let's go back now. Sorry. So let's go back here. So 
but now what is more interesting in uh, uh, more recent experiments, they have put the same object or a similar object, not exactly the same, uh, in a viscous liquid. So instead of being uh, uh, constrained to move into this tube, and of course the, it's clear that the thrust is due to the interaction of this rubber uh, ring with, with the tube, they have put this kind of uh, devices in a viscous liquid. And uh, so this is the Institute for Problems in Mechanics of the Russian Academy of Sciences. And they have started a number of extremely interesting experiments to see how these uh, objects that are uh, vibrating can move in a viscous liquid. And there are several papers uh, that address this problem from the experimental point of view and from the mathematical viewpoint. Um, so in these cases, the propulsion is not due to change in shape, but may be modeled, modeled with a time periodic distribution of velocity at the interface body liquid. So there is this uh, cylinder in the, in the example that I gave you a moment ago that is vibrating. So you can see that uh, the interface, if you, if you put it in, in a viscous liquid, so basically it is the interface of uh, the, the cylinder and the liquid that is subject to a time periodic distribution of velocity. Uh, it goes almost without saying that uh, in spite of the uh, interesting results in all these papers, uh, there is no right, rigorous mathematical analysis uh, of this uh, to interpret this phenomenon. Okay, so now, what are these basic open questions that I would like to address? Uh, let me state it in a, in a general way. So assume that I have a macroscopic body. Macroscopic, I mean, it's not, uh, uh, it's, not uh, uh, it, it's macroscopic, <laughs> <coughs> excuse me and assume that this body is self-propelling in a viscous liquid by a time periodic drive mechanism, I symbolically uh, denoted it by this M of T that is periodic in time. And so the question is, what is the thrust that is generated by M? So what is the force? So I have this periodic, uh, this periodic mechanism that is acting on the body, and uh, uh, what is the part of this periodic uh, mechanism that really propels the body? And what is the relation between the thrust, so the driving force, and the translational velocity of this? So I want to make a quantitative analysis. Now, what is the difficulty? You will see it when I will go uh, on in my, in my talk. So the, the, the difficulty is that uh, this uh, problem, these questions, they cannot be addressed uh, by any linearization argument. So one has to use really nonlinear uh, tools and nonlinear arguments in order to answer those two questions. And the reason is because the, the, the driving mechanism has a zero average over a period. Now, just to try to make, uh, to, to understand and to make it clear why the, uh, this mechanism has to have zero average, at least in the examples that I brought you. Uh, previously, let's consider just the cylinder, the case of a cylinder, okay? So this cylinder, we said, goes back and forth, back and forth like this, right? This is basically the vibration of the cylinder, okay? So we modeled this vibration with the distribution of velocity at the boundary, okay? So now, uh, so from the Eulerian uh, point of view, if we want to study the motion of uh, this body in a Navier-Stokes fluid, of course, we have to prescribe some velocity at the boundary. Now, the velocity at the boundary uh, has to have zero average. And in fact, it's easily seen because, so this thing going back and forth. So pick a point on the surface of the cylinder at time t equals zero, let's say. So x at time t equals zero. Then the cylinder moves, goes to some position xt, and then goes back, of course, to the same position after the time t. That's why you have periodicity, the vibration, right? So if V star is the velocity of the particle of the particles at the boundary of this cylinder, you have to have that the integral between zero and capital T of V star, which is x at capital T minus x at time zero, is equal to zero. So the driving mechanism that is the boundary distribution of velocity has to have zero average. And this makes the problem difficult. <laughs> and at the same time, interesting, of course. 
In fact, I will show you that self propulsion <clears throat> is a real nonlinear phenomenon. So we have to use nonlinear tools to solve it. Okay, so now the mathematical formulation in, in mathematical terms. So we have this rigid body, <clears throat> excuse me, that moves in a Navier-Stokes liquid that fills the whole space outside B. And by driving mechanism, I use a time periodic distribution of velocity at the interface uh, body liquid. Okay, <clears throat> now just for simplicity, only for simplicity, I am assuming that this body B cannot rotate. So from the, let's say, from the physical viewpoint, I'm assuming that uh, on the body there is a suitable torque that prevents B from spinning, okay? So that the motion of B is just translatory. I denote by gamma the transla translation of velocity. <clears throat> and of course, this gamma is an unknown, is the unknown translation of velocity. So now, uh, the assumption that the body does not spin, as I said, is just made for the sake of simplicity. Uh, I could extend uh, the, or one could extend the, uh, these results that I'm going to present to a more general case of a rotating body, but there is no conceptual difficulty. It's just a technical difficulty. Uh, the other thing, which is obvious, uh, this is a, uh, a problem of, of the type fluid structure because the motion of the body is not prescribed and therefore it's a fluid structure, a, a, a typical fluid structure problem, interaction problem. And the third remark is that the model directly applies to the vibration induced self-propulsion as I showed before with the cylinder moving back and forth. However, uh, it can in principle also be applied to, <clears throat> to modeling a fish because uh, where basically the rigid body and its moving parts uh, are uh, boundary velocity distribution. And uh, this is, you know, seems to be a little bit weird, say a rigid body that uh, can model a, a fish that is a, a body that uh, changes its shape with the time. But uh, we can make a transformation in principle, as I said, this is just a, a good guess. It's not something that I've done or saying is, is, is simple to do. But in principle, you know, when we have a shape changing body, problem body, then you can make a, a transformation and reduce everything to a fixed configuration. <clears throat> and, uh, and therefore the fixed configuration is basically a rigid body. And therefore this kind of ideas that I explained for rigid bodies in principle could be applied also to more complicated situation of shape changing bodies. But this is just a remark. Okay, so what are the equations? The equations are uh, here, the Navier-Stokes equations with gamma being the translational velocity. <clears throat> v star is the quantity that is given. This, uh, this, uh, this uh, equation here, the last equation, so basically these are Navier-Stokes equations, these are boundary conditions. And the last condition is just the condition of self propulsion. So this, the zero here means that there are no forces acting on the body. Uh, the body just moves uh, if it moves because of this uh, boundary distribution, V star, okay? And so what are the unknowns? Unknowns are the velocity field of the fluid, the pressure field, and the, the translational velocity. <clears throat> so our problem <clears throat> is the following. Given a bound t periodic boundary velocity distribution, I want to find sufficient and necessary conditions on V star that ensure that the body really moves. So this means that the average velocity, the average speed of velocity of the body must be non-zero. So the average velo the velocity of the body averaged over a period has to be non-zero. In fact, if it is non-zero, then you see immediately that for at each period of time, capital T, the body covers a distance D that is equal to the uh, modules of, uh, of, the, of the average velocity times capital T. So our objective is to find solutions for which, I mean, find V star, find distribution of velocity for which this Xi, the average velocity of the body is not zero. The average translation of velocity of the body is not zero. This is our problem. Okay, so immediately a counter example. So not any distribution of velocity is able to propel a body. So to have Xi 
non-zero. <coughs> in fact, uh, uh, take uh, a function, scalar function, <coughs> that is t-periodic and with zero average. Okay, so the scalar function has zero average. And then take psi to be a solution to the Neumann problem. This is a Neumann problem in the exterior domain omega, corresponding to data f having zero average spatial average on the surface of the of omega. So on the on d omega, on partial omega, the integral is equal to zero. So the two ingredients are a and psi. Then you construct this solution to the problem. Velocity field that is equal to this scalar function with zero average times the gradient of size. So these are potential like velocity fields. This is the corresponding pressure field and this is the corresponding translational velocity. So this V, P and gamma are solutions provided we take the distribution of velocity V star of this form. Okay, so this is solution corresponding to this boundary, uh, to this boundary distribution of velocity. And uh, you immediately see since A has zero average over a period, if you take the average of gamma over a period, you get zero. So the body does not move. The only thing the body can do is oscillate because <clears throat> gamma is time periodic. So the body goes back and forth without a net motion. So we already know that not every distribution of velocity at the boundary will move the body. Okay, so number one. Now, second step, we go for a weak formulation, classical weak formulation of the problem. So um, we introduce a, a test function space defined as follows. Uh, psi, um, the, the test, of, I mean, the, the space of function psi, which are of class C1 on space time. Uh, um, they are periodic, of course, in time. They are divergence free. And moreover, in a neighborhood of uh, the, the, the surface of the body, let's say in a neighborhood of, the, of, uh, of, uh, omega, of the omega, uh, they reduce to a, a vector time, uh, I mean, to a vector depending only on time. And I use this symbol psi to mean that this vector may depend, of course, on psi. Okay, so basically they reduce to translation nearby the boundary. And uh, moreover, they are of bounded support. So for each psi, uh, there exists some radius such that uh, this psi, psi of x and t is equal to zero if you are outside the ball of radius rho. Okay, <clears throat> all right. Moreover, introduce the, this classical uh, function space, uh, D12, that is a space of, uh, it's the classical homogeneous ensemble space of order one, two. So functions which are locally in W12 and uh, the gradient uh, in uh, the Dirichlet uh, gradient is, uh, is uh, the Dirichlet norm is finite. Okay, so now this pair V gamma is called the periodic, uh, T-periodic weak solution. If V and gamma of course are both T-periodic, V is in this space here so it's L2 in time in the space, in the, in the homogeneous solar space D12 and gamma is in L2 zero T. Moreover, V assumes the, this, this boundary value V star and gamma plus gamma in the trace sense and satisfies the original equation in a distributional sense. So for all psi test function. So this is a classical definition, nothing new here. Then you can prove a theorem. So uh, let's take the boundary data V star to be delta capital V star, where capital V star is sufficiently regular and moreover has a zero flux through the boundary, okay? Uh, this assumption is probably not necessary, but it's uh, absolutely, uh, I mean, uh, if it is necessary, I mean, uh, it's enough for, for what I want to say. So probably this could be removed, the zero flux, but it doesn't really matter. Then under this assumption, we can find a delta naught such that for each delta in zero delta naught, so if basically the boundary, this distribution, V star is sufficiently small in some norm, in suitable norm, then there exists at least one weak solution, the corresponding uh, weak solution. Moreover, this, uh, this weak solution satisfies this estimate with delta here, where delta is the magnitude in suitable uh, trace space of this V star. 
So also this is, is nothing new, uh, nothing new. Uh, probably, as I said, I can remove this assumption, we can make delta not small but arbitrary, but this will be absolutely irrelevant for what I want to say. Okay, so now uh, we have a beautiful existence, or if you wish, very simple <laughs> existence theorem, because this is not uh, difficult to prove. The question is, I want to know when uh, these solutions are able, I mean, under which condition on V star, these solutions have a non-zero average velocity. So the, 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 the average of gamma over a period is non-zero. Okay, so let me introduce this notation. By a bar, I denote the average over a period of the quantity F. Then uh, we take the weak solution V and gamma, and rescale it with delta. So delta is the same, uh, is the uh, magnitude of the boundary condition. And moreover, uh, the scaled uh, quantity, uh, we split it to, into uh, a, a purely periodic part, so with zero average, and an average part, U time independent. And the same we do with, we do with the translation of velocity. We split it into a part with zero average, and another part which is only is a constant side. Okay, so uh, then uh, if we do the simple calculation, we show that this W, sorry, this U, that the time independent part of the solution and Xi, the time independent part of the, of, of the velocity, uh, satisfies a kind of uh, nonlinear uh, Navier-Stokes problem with the addition, the, addi the addition of uh, the self-propelled condition, the one at the very bottom here, okay? All right, so uh, uh, now what do we do? Well, there is this delta here that comes out after the scaling that we did before. So now we want to let delta to zero. Now you see from here that uh, formally, if we take delta to zero, this disappear, uh, the nonlinear terms disappear, and what we get eventually is a linear problem, okay? So let's do this, and in fact, we have a lemma that says that uh, let delta uh, between zero and delta zero corresponding solution, weak solutions V delta, gamma delta. Then as delta goes to zero, U delta tends to U naught and Xi delta tends to Xi naught in suitable norms, where this U naught and Xi naught are unique solutions to this Stokes problem, okay? So indeed, the weak solution when delta goes to zero, which means uh, the, the data are becoming smaller and smaller, uh, they tend to this Stokes problem here, okay? So now, since Xi delta tends to Xi naught, we can have, the, we have this nice corollary that a sufficient condition for self-propulsion, so for Xi delta to be non-zero, is that Xi naught has to be non-zero. So if we find conditions on Xi naught, that uh, that uh, ensure that xi not conditions that ensure excuse me that xi naught is not zero then xi delta will not be zero and therefore we have self the, the self propulsion condition that we are looking for okay so we have to study basically this simple linear stokes problem and uh, here is uh, so i here in the next slide i say when is xi naught so our problem is to find conditions for which this xi naught is non-zero. So the solution, the xi naught coming from the solution to the linear Stokes problem. Okay, so uh, we introduce auxiliary fields. Uh, these auxiliary fields are nothing but uh, uh, Stokes uh, solutions in exterior domains correspond with the boundary data that are just uh, the uh, E1, E2, and E3, so the three unit vectors and define this G sub i as the stress vector at the boundary of this Stokes solutions. So this G sub i are just the stress vectors of the, at the boundary. And then you prove the following, that uh, there exists an invertible matrix that depends only on the body, such that Xi naught is equal to this. So you give an explicit form for Xi naught, and from which you can see immediately when and only when this Xi naught is non-zero, okay? So this is the expression that you get for Xi naught. And therefore, since we want this Xi naught to be non-zero, uh, we see that this happens if and only if the average 
of the boundary data project in a non-vanishing way on this three-dimensional space of this G, of the, the, um, uh, this three-dimensional space characterized by the three G sub I, okay? And uh, so we get the first interesting information that if the average is zero, which is the case we are really interested in, right? We want zero average, then psi naught is equal to zero, and the linearized approximation does not give any information because we know that when delta goes to zero, psi delta tends to psi naught, and therefore psi naught is equal to zero. So we cannot say if psi delta is non zero. This can be summarized in the following theorem. So assume that big gamma is a weak solution corresponding to the data v star, little v star equals delta capital V star, uh, denote by capital G this this vector here and then there exists a delta naught uh, greater than zero such that for all delta you know gamma bar which is the average velocity is equal to delta a times g plus uh, higher order terms and uh, uh, as i said before well two remarks actually the first is that if this v bar is non-zero a sufficient condition for self-proportion is that g has to be non-zero so this quantity has to be non-zero, but most, more importantly, that if the average is equal to zero, cell propulsion must occur, at, if, if it occurs, must occur at an order higher than one in delta. And because, you know, if G is equal to zero, gamma bar is high order in delta from this formula here. And as I said before, the phenomenon is therefore strictly nonlinear because the linear approximation does not give any information. So now let's go to the, uh, after, you know, this uh, kind of preface, let's go to the real interesting problem. So now we assume that the average is zero. So we know that uh, we, if uh, we cannot uh, use the linearized approximation, because when delta goes to zero, the solution, the, this weak solution tends to zero, and therefore we have no information. We were hoping that the linear approximation could give some information so to have a non-zero solution but in the case of zero average the solution is identically zero and of course this so this is exactly what happens in the case of vibration induced self-propulsion that the average is equal to zero okay so now what is the basic idea the basic idea is to use a contradiction argument at a non-linear level directly at the non-linear level and goes as follows so we take the solution V again, velocity and uh, translational velocity, velocity of the fluid and translational velocity of the body. And we do the splitting, the same splitting as before without scaling, just a simple splitting. So this lab W is zero average, U uh, depends only on X, doesn't depend on time. We take the translational velocity and again, we do the same splitting. And uh, uh, therefore, when we do the splitting of a uh, purely oscillatory part and an average part, then the original problem can be split into a coupled elliptic parabolic problem of this sort. So the average component of the velocity, which is time independent, and the, the time independent part of uh, the translational velocity of the body, they satisfy, a, a let's say, an elliptic problem, quote unquote, of course, uh, which is a nonlinear Navier-Stokes equation, as you see from here, basically, is a nonlinear, uh, no, <laughs> of course, nonlinear, <laughs> is a kind of Navier-Stokes equation, plus, uh, and this is extremely important, plus we have the self-propelled condition here. This is crucial, okay? All right, and uh, then we have the purely uh, periodic part, uh, which is the equation for W. Okay, again with the, the self-propelled condition here. Okay, so now what is the first idea? The first idea is that, as you see, this W, this W depends on U, right? Uh, and depends on V star, of course, depends on V star and depends on U. Uh, Xi, of course, is the trace at the boundary of U. So Xi basically saying that it depends on U means also that it depends on Xi. So the idea is to um, 
try to write the solution to this problem as an implicit function of u and v star. And in fact, this can be done. So if v star and u are sufficiently small, then we can solve implicitly for w and chi in terms of v star and u. And now, you know, if you go here, if, if you go now to the elliptic equation, this, this equation, this equation here, okay, this equation here, you see, we can replace this w and chi as a function of uh, u and v star, right? Once we solve uh, the elliptic, the parabolic equation here, then we can replace it in the first one and uh, we obtain the following. So we, we have that u and xi, they satisfy a Navier-Stokes kind of problem with uh, a nonlinear, I mean, with the nonlinear contribution here. I don't know why it's not working, but okay. So a nonlinear contribution here that depends on v star and u, plus, again, it's crucial, the self-propelled condition. Now, what is this f explicitly? is given at the bottom of the slide. Uh, there is the usual nonlinear term, the Navier-Stokes term, plus this contribution due to W and chi, okay? So self-propulsion amounts to find a distribution of velocity V star with the, this, this, this distribution of velocity V star with zero average for which the elliptic problem, this elliptic problem, this nonlinear uh, elliptic problem has a solution with xi non-zero, okay? So basically, that's, that's at the end of the story, uh, at the end of the game, this is what we have to prove. That this elliptic problem, we have to find for which V star, this elliptic problem has a solution u xi with xi non-zero. Okay, so now it, this is the crucial point. So this is a notorious uh, homogeneous Sobolev space. It's D1 three halves. So it's not the D1 two that we considered before, but is the space of uh, functions which are local in this Sobolev space with the gradients that are in three halves, okay? And uh, we can show the following lemma. That let V star be equal to delta capital V star. So delta is the magnitude of this, the, the boundary data. And then for all delta in some interval zero, delta zero, this problem, this nonlinear elliptic problem that we are interested in, has at least one solution with the velocity field in this homogeneous Sobolev space here. Now, those of you, uh, and I know that the, the Japanese school is, uh, has written, especially Professor Kozono, Professor Yamazaki, they've written several papers just to, uh, to show that the, the Navier-Stokes equations are not solvable in this space. Know that, uh, as I said, that uh, in general, the Navier-Stokes equations, they do not have a solution in this space because uh, you have to, this, is, this space is too, is too uh, narrow. You have to enlarge this space to go and go to uh, Lorentz spaces, okay? But what is interesting is that nevertheless, for my nonlinear problem here, you are able to show solutions in the homogeneous solid space, D1, three halves. How is this possible? Well, it is possible because of the self-propelled condition. So without the self-propelled condition, one would not be able to prove. Actually, it's not true. Without there is a famous paper by Professor Sor and Professor Cozon that show that you know it is not it is not the case. Okay, so thanks to this self-propelled condition, in fact, uh, uh, we can show that there exists uh, for all delta. So for any boundary data, we can find uh, a solution to this nonlinear elliptic problem. Okay, so now here is the contradiction argument. Suppose that xi is equal to zero. Then from the previous result, we obtain that for all the star boundary conditions with the in norm sufficiently small, this problem here has a solution in the space D1, three halves omega. 
And as I said, this is a bad space. And in fact, one can show that the nonlinear operator that is that corresponds to this nonlinear problem. So the nonlinear operator defined in uh, in suitably in this homogeneous subway space is Fredel of negative index. Okay, so now what why is it important that this Fredel of negative index? Okay, let me remind you this important property of Fredel's of negative index. So uh, suppose that X and Y are Banach spaces, M is a C1 map from X into Y. And uh, uh, we say, I mean, we say it's known that the thread of this operator M is freedom of index M if uh, the derivative at any point X of uh, capital X is freedom of index M, okay? I'm assuming that this operator M is defined in the whole space capital X. Okay, so this is the definition of uh, freedom for a nonlinear operator. Now there is this important result of Smale that says that uh, if I have a C1 uh, map from X to Y and uh, the Fredholm index uh, is negative, then the equation MX equals Y has a solution if and only if uh, this Y belongs to a very, very bad set. So is the set uh, that uh, this set for which this problem has a solution, this equation has a solution, has to have an empty interior. So basically means that if I change this y by an epsilon uh, into, so instead of y, I consider y plus epsilon something else, this equation might not, definitely not might not, definitely has no solution. So the, 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 the set of uh, right hand side for which this equation may have a solution is very bad as an empty interior. Now, how this apply to our case? So in our problem, uh, we show that the set R, the bad set, is characterized by those and only those boundary conditions such that this uh, function, this nonlinear function of V star and Y satisfies a precise non-local compatibility condition, okay? So what is this compatibility condition? Again, uh, let us consider these auxiliary fields, uh, which are the same as the little h. The only thing is that they are little h minus e sub i. So that's what we have. Okay, so uh, then one show that the, the problem can have a solution in this d1 three halves if and only if this compatibility condition is satisfied. This one here, if I can click on that. Yeah, oops. So this condition has to be satisfied for each h i okay so uh, let me recap this problem here thanks to the fact that the main operator is a fredel of negative index can have a solution if and only if this f the right hand side satisfies this compatibility condition okay now, please keep in mind that this problem has zero translational velocity. You know, the boundary ux is equal to zero. Okay, we are assuming by contradiction that xi is equal to zero. Okay, so now, if we can choose v star in such a way that the compatibility condition is uh, violated, then xi cannot be zero. And therefore, xi has to be non-zero. So we have to find v star that violate the compatibility condition because if they violate the compatibility condition then this so this set of solutions this, this this equations cannot have a solution in that space but this this, this set of solution comes from the fact that we are assuming that xi is equal to zero so if this compatibility condition is violated xi has to be necessarily non-zero and therefore, boundary conditions that ensure this equation number one will be able to propel the body B. So now let's find sufficient conditions on V star. And uh, so, uh, so uh, V star, please keep in mind that this v, little V star is delta capital V star. So this capital V star basically is uh, independent of, uh, so 
that is the magnitude of little v star. So uh, for a given v star, we consider this linear problem, and we denote by v naught the chi naught the solution to this linear problem, and uh, we can show very easily that I mean it's simple that for any v star uh, with the zero average here, uh, we can find one and only one corresponding solution to this to this problem here that uh, stays in the maximum regularity class. So the derivative are in LQ, LQ, and V is in LQ, W, 2, Q, and chi naught is in W, 1, Q. Uh, okay, so uh, for any V star sufficiently smooth, I have a maximum regularity solution to this problem here. Now let's define this capital G. Now what is this capital G? Is the average of uh, average over time of uh, this quantity here, where v naught and chi naught are the solution to this problem here. Okay. Now, uh, as you see, this vector g is determined by the boundary distribution v star because this v naught and chi naught depend only on v star and depends on the shade of the body, so depends on omega, depends on nu the viscosity of the liquid and depends on the mass m of the body because you know these are parameters nu and m that are into the equations for v naught okay well this g is exactly the thrust for the self propulsion when the average is equal to zero in fact we have this theorem now which basically summarizes the results so assume that V star is equal to delta capital V star. So delta is the magnitude of uh, the boundary distribution. Then there exists a delta naught such that for any delta in zero, delta zero, the original problem has one and only one smooth anti-periodic solution. I'm skipping all the technical details. So, I mean, the, which spaces these solutions belong, trust me, is basically is a, smooth, is a smooth solution. So for any V star, uh, of the type delta capital V star and delta sufficiently small, I can find one and only one solution to the original problem. Now, assume that now this G is non-zero. G is this vector here. Okay, assume that G is not zero, then the compatibility condition is violated. And as a consequence, gamma bar, so means the average the translation of the body has to be non-zero, therefore the body self propels and even more we can give a precise uh, form of the translational uh, of the average translational velocity because it's delta squared capital g plus high order terms so you see is delta squared so as expected the velocity of propulsion is of an order higher than one in delta because we know that the at, at order delta the self propulsion velocity is zero we just proved it, I mean, at the beginning of the talk. Now, the other interesting question is the following. He said, well, you may say, well, you found that if G is non-zero, then you have self-propulsion. But is really this G non-zero necessary for self-propulsion? So basically, can I find the, the body that moves and G is equal to zero? Well, in general, no. Uh, the condition G non-zero is not only sufficient, as I showed, but it's also necessary because we have a theorem that uh, uh, that B let B be an arbitrary smooth bounded domain of uh, R three and of any shape and mass. Then, for arbitrary delta greater than zero, we can always find the smooth distribution of boundary velocity such that G is equal to zero and B has a zero net motion, so B can only oscillate. So, in this sense the condition G non-zero is also necessary for, you know, for self-propulsion. Future study, uh, two things, and I guess that I am, I am done. Yes. So two things. So the first thing is that, uh, uh, you know, this, this, this vector has to be non-zero. This G here has to be non-zero for self-propulsion. Now, question is, uh, how do I, uh, and where v naught is the solution to this problem here. So the question is, can we pro provide explicit examples of b and v star of boundary velocity for which g is not zero? 
So we know that this G being non-zero is the necessary and sufficient condition for self-propulsion. But can we just uh, say, okay, here is a body and this is the distribution of velocity that we need to have G non-zero. So this is under investigation. And of course, to try to extend the results to the case of shape changing self-propellant body. So the real fish that goes, you know, whose tail goes back and forth and the fish moves. As I said, in principle, I don't see a strict uh, uh, difficulty, I mean, a specific difficulty for not uh, obtaining such a result. But uh, as you saw, uh, as you know, the devil is in the, the devil is in the details. And so you never know that <laughs> there is something not working. And, um, and so at the end, I really thank you for, for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much. So interesting talk. And then now, 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 sorry, no. Okay. Uh, now, now is the time to have some question. I want to get some question or comment from the audience. Okay, okay. So I, I think uh, maybe. So the first you you show some kind of existence theorem, and then you use uh, the contradiction argument, and then you show the c equal non zero, right? Yeah. Yes. This is the story. Uh, you are yeah. story. Exactly. This is the story. Okay. Yeah. So it's a very fantastic story because, uh, but then, uh, I I don't catch the B star. The last moment you show some of the new future program, and yes. then uh, you want get to B star, you want to find some B star and what would the motion yeah. be? And the, but what is a B star? Yeah, let, I don't remember exactly. Let, let me let me share again. Okay, I have it here actually. Yeah. Okay. So basically okay. So what, what I showed by that contradiction argument is basically that uh, the, this, uh, this body can move, you know, by really move. If, uh, if uh, basically and only if uh, this vector G is not zero, okay? So that's, that's basically the, 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 the end of the, and uh, that uh, if this G is not zero, then, uh, then the, this is the translation, this is the, the translation of the this one here at the bottom. Yeah, this one here, you see? This is the, the, the translation of velocity over the body, if G is non zero. Okay, so now, however, this G, what is this G? So, as you see, this G involves this V naught and chi naught, okay? This, work, this HI uh, are also, you know, this HI for certain, uh, for certain shapes, yes, one can yes, explicit, yes. explicitly. Now, so, so, so I, it's like now I, I want to, find really an example of uh, the body oh. and uh -huh. uh, a distribution of velocity v star which mm -hmm. makes uh, this g non zero so you know i i, I, I don't know I, I take an ellipsoid for instance so what is the distribution of velocity that i have to put on the surface of an ellipsoid to have this g non zero yes. okay so in, in a kind of uh, explicit mm -hmm. okay. um, Example. I see. Uh -huh. Maybe you have some of the ideas in mind in your mind, or yes, I'm working on it. I mean, you have just to go by by kind of trial and error. So you have to have an idea what you you know. Uh, I mean, I'm I'm working. I I don't have anything definite, so that's why I didn't present it. You, you, you are, for example, you have pictures. Of course, it is moving, yeah, I have something, moving I have up. Something in my mind, but I have to still work on it. So I still have to work on it. I don't have. It's any. a. It's a bit. That place is a bit. It's a rectangle, like a rectangle, and uh, the star is. I don't yeah. know. Yeah. You know, uh, this is a kind of uh, things where also numerics can help. So oh, for instance, I see. Uh -huh. because you, you, what what numerics can do is just to give some. Uh, 
boundary velocity, calculate mm -hmm. the solution V0. Yes, and yes. what is if G yes, is, yes, 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 yes. When is non zero to have an idea. And then the analysis can be done, I mean, from a rigorous mathematical viewpoint, but numerics could be really of help sure. in understanding, I guess. Yeah. So, so that's it. You know, I, you know, as, as I said, uh, the, the, the fun thing with this is that, uh, uh, you know, when you, are, you, when you have uh, elliptic problems, you try to mm -hmm. avoid treadle moderators with the mm -hmm. negative index, mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, the problem is not well set if for your sure. operator is a, and what is interesting is that in this case, mm -hmm. just because the operator is the negative, then, then you can show the, you know, you can prove the existence. I mean, prove this, you know, show, yeah. show your theorem just because of the, of the negativity of the, of the, of the index of the, of the yeah. of the yeah. So, yeah. So that's because, is, because you have to find some of the non trivial zero solution, like, Exactly. It's just the contradiction, right? So basically, yes, 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 I understood. This point, so if, maybe I understood. If the, if, the trans, if the translational velocity is zero, then mm. the operator becomes uh, of negative index. Sure, I see. And, so, and then if I uh, show that uh, the operator cannot be of negative index, mm. then the translational velocity has to be non-zero, right? Yeah. Because if it's zero, then negative Fredholm operator. So if I find conditions for which the, mm. the operator is not negative, negative yeah, index, yeah, yeah. Then, then I'm done, basically. Yeah, right. Sure, yeah, it is very fa fantastic uh, argument, I guess. I never yeah, found I mean, it sounds such an argument. Okay. Yeah, it was fun. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 sure. But by, by the way, the, your existence, so you need some kind of smallness because you have delta yeah, yeah. naught, I, I don't remember, yeah, but... Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah. I see, I see. But first you start with some kind of weak solution, right? Yeah, I start but with my, weak solutions. I could prove it without any restriction. I just I see, I see. It with because I wanted to show that uh, even in the frame of weak solutions, uh, if you the uh, uh, if uh, the average velocity is zero, if the the yes. distribution uh, of velo uh, the velocity at the boundary has zero average, then uh, the uh, the linear the linearization doesn't help because I see, I see. the linearization okay. has yeah mm -hmm. zero. Basically, it's identically zero the linearization. So yes. if the linearization is identically zero, <laughs> of course you cannot construct a solution around. The <laughs> I see. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, because it's well, not. It's, yeah. I mean, you can, but it's not interesting. Yeah. So. Yeah, sure. I Paul, I'm sorry that today I won't keep discussing, but maybe there is time assume. Of course. Resume. Therefore, maybe I won't stop now. Thank you so much. Your talk is a very interesting talk. I want to see you soon in somewhere. Thank you. Thank you.